So, futures are, in a sense, a lot more complicated. They're more complicated because there is daily settlement. Another complication, which is actually a very good thing for futures, is that when it's extracted on the exchange, let's say I'm a buyer and you're a seller, I'm a long, you're a short. Uh, when we buy and sell, so this will be me, I go long. When I go long, I don't go long against you. I go long against the exchange. So, when I make a trade and I am long, the exchange is short against me. Now, when her, she goes short, she goes short against the exchange. In other words, when I buy, I, the exchange sells to me. When she sells, the exchange goes long against you. So, the point is that when I trade on the futures, I'm not trading against you. I'm trading against the exchange. This is done for the reason that if you and me make a contract and for some reason you go bankrupt, doesn't mean I'm going to take a loss. You are not the counterparty. Counterparty. Counterparty is the other side of a derivative trade. If I'm the long, the counterparty is the side that takes the short. If you're the short, the counterparty is the other side that takes the long. Okay. So, in any derivative contract, there is a counterparty risk. Counterparty risk is the risk that the other side of the contract does not want to pay or is not willing to pay or worse, is not able to pay because when the time comes, they are bankrupt or gone or disappear, okay? So, in derivatives, you always have a counterparty risk. Derivative always is associated with some sort of a contract in the future, 12 months down the road. And if I'm a long oil and you're short oil, I expect you to deliver 1,000 barrels of oil. But a year from now, you might not have the oil, you might not be able to find the oil. Well, you might not, you might be dead, right? I mean, things do happen. In, in business, we'll call it bankrupt, okay? So if you're bankrupt, I take a loss. No, not you personally, right? So, counterparty risk is a major risk. Therefore, the exchange takes the counterparty against all longs and counterparty against the all shorts. So, when I'm trading and I have a long, the counterparty is the exchange itself. When you're short, the counterparty uh, is the exchange. So, the exchange takes all the counterparty risk. So, I don't have to worry about you or anybody else going bankrupt. The only one I gotta worry about is the exchange itself going bankrupt. And the exchange has a number of protections. Well, the first basic protection for any futures contract, 
for the exchange is called initial margin. Whether you are a long or whether you are a short, if you want to buy a long position in gold or sell a short position in gold, you need to have some money in your account. And the exchange will say, for example, I'm making the number, but it's close to the real, to the true number, is that for a contract of 100 ounces, you need to have 2,000 US dollars of cash in your account. If you have $5,000, everything in your account, at best you can go long or short two contracts because two contracts will require four. So initial margin is the amount of money that you must have available, free and available in your account to guarantee the contract. If something happens, the exchange will take or keep the money. So that's initial margin. The margin is the same for the long as well for the short. So both the long and the short must have the initial margin available at the exchange. The exchange keep this as a guarantee for the performance of the contract. Okay. So that's the initial margin. And it goes for both sides is 2,000. Well, remember that on the first day when the gold went up, my 2,000, which I had as initial margin, my account became 2,500. But yours from 2,000, you already lost, so yours is 500. The next thing which the exchange uses is called maintenance. Margin. Maintenance margin is a little lower than the initial margin as, let's say, I'm making a number, $1,500, which means the following. You've got to have $2,000 to initiate, to enter the position, to short. When you lose more than $500, you've got to put up more money. In other words, if your account becomes 1,400, 1,300, or just 1,000, or down to zero, you'll have to bring the money back to the initial margin. We call this a margin call. Margin call means you lost money on your trade, the money from your account went to my account. Now, you either have to take out of your pocket or out of your uh, bank account more money and send it to your broker, to the exchange. If you don't send it within a day or two, the exchange will close your contract. It will sell your contract. It will, it will liquidate your contract. In other words, you either give them more money or they'll close your position so that the exchange itself protects from further losses. In other words, they got 2,000 of your money to guarantee this contract. When the, you, the, your, your deposit goes less than 1,500, you have to give more money. If you don't give it within a day, they'll close the contract and they take all the losses. If you put up more money, you refill your account and you can play another day on the exchange. So, initial margin and maintenance margin protect the exchange from losses and this is the protection that the exchange has and therefore that the winning party has that, for example, I may have this contract and over the months I may win 20 thousand dollars. Well, these twenty thousand dollars will come from all the people who are short against me. They'll have to have the two thousand dollar deposit and have margin calls where they got to keep paying and keep paying. So as long as they pay to the exchange, 
and exchange a solvent, I will get my $20,000 of winning. So the main the initial margin, the maintenance margin, and the margin call is a mechanism to reduce significantly the counterparty risk. Well, it's actually to reduce the risk of the exchange taking a loss and going bankrupt. So that's the futures market. All right. Counterparty, default, and all those things. Uh, a lot of times, uh, financial institutions will trade and there will be one particular person who will take significant amount of futures or derivative positions. That particular person can take a size that's going to be in the, in the derivative market that's going to be significantly larger than the whole financial institution and they like to call these type of traders rogue trader is a trader in a financial institution which takes a very high position, usually tens of thousands of contracts, worth billions of dollars, okay? And they'll take, a, it's called an outsized position, position much larger than the capacity of the financial institution to handle. And when the derivative position goes wrong, the whole financial institution goes bankrupt and usually needs a government bailout. Well, the institution, major financial institution, will never, ever admit that the financial institution was wrong. They never say, it was our fault. They will point to one person there and say, it is his fault. He was a criminal. He did it unauthorized. And, you know, they call that person a rogue trader. So, when the financial institution is to blame, they never say, say it is our fault. They always point at someone as someone else's fault, one particular fault. It's like the government. Governments never admit that it's their fault. They always find a scapegoat, okay? They always find somebody else to blame for the problems that they cause in the So, road traders are usually extremely aggressive traders, they are high risk takers and sometimes the financial institution will know but a lot of times they will not know that this trader is taking huge positions, huge derivative risks and that jeopardize the solvency in the future of the financial institution. Okay, let's see what else we got here. Uh, some of those terms. The first thing is every contract will have a price. The price will change from minute to minute, from second to second, but the contract will have a market price, the price at which you and me are going to sell. That's not part of the contract itself, but it's a characteristic. If you have gold, gold will have a price. Now the contract itself will have a size. Every contract must have a size. 100 ounces of gold, 1,000 kilograms of rice, okay? A ton of zinc, a ton of copper. Standard contract size will be 1,000 barrels of oil, okay? So the size will be usually a nice round number that's easy to remember and easy to calculate, like 100,000 US dollars, okay. So that's the size. 
Uh, we call this, uh, let's do this. Again, they're all contracts. It's called contract size. Uh, let's see. Specification. Well, you guys should probably most likely know that there are hundreds and hundreds of different types of rice. Rice is not one single rice, but it's a Thai rice and Basmati rice and you know Indian type of rice and Chinese rice and uh, then there is the white rice and the brown rice and the black rice. There are hundreds and hundreds of sorts of rice. So if you have a futures contract, you have to specify the quality. What kind of rice? Is it a one month old or six years old? Well, some of you, I guess, you'll agree that five year old rice is not kind of like two month old rice, right? So, all this list, somehow you need to be very clear about the quality of the rice. Well, that's the thing you understand. If it's crude oil, crude oil could have thousands of different variations. One of them is called sourness, how much sulfur it has, how much clean it is, or how much dirty it is. Does it pour? Is it very clean and very fluid? Or is it very dark and very thick? So, if you start thinking, uh, crude oil has, again, thousands of different variations. Natural gas is not one gas. You know, you have methane, okay, that's the first order of gas. The second order gas is called ethane. Next one is propane, butane. Okay, these are all different versions of natural gas. These are all gases, they're all carbohydrates. Oh, then go heptane. Uh, oh, heptane. Next one is hexane. All right, these are all different carbohydrates, okay, carbohydrates. Well, it may be 5% of this, 5% of this, 90% of this. It may be 1% of this, 2% of this, 20% of this, 50% of this, 70%. So, you got this as, you know, first order, second, third, fourth, you know, this is going to be, going to have C1, this is going to be C2, C3, C4, C5. C, 6, whatever, with all the H's. Again, each one particular gas coming out of somewhere is going to be totally different from any of the other gas. You need a very clear specification of what quality it is and how you make adjustments. So we need to see how fluid the oil is. And if it's thicker, it's going to be cheaper, a lower quality. So, the specification is very important. Well, the simplest specification of a commodity for a commodity will be gold. And the specification is simply 999. That's the purity of gold, which is the same as saying that it's going to be 0.999 gold and one in a thousand will be something else. In other words, it's going to be 99.9 pure gold. It will be similar for silver. Okay? So, for gold and for silver, it's very clear. For metals, it's very easy. But things like rice, it's not very clear. I mean, Will the grains be small or middle size or big size? Would it be white polished, white unpolished? Would it be brown rice? Again, if it's rice, things get very complicated, okay? They're, same thing for wheat, it's similar for corn, but a contract's gotta have a specification. Next thing, because it's a futures, it's 
three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now. That's not how we measure the futures. We measure the futures by, it's called delivery month. It's going to be January. Usually, I'm just picking a random number, January 20th. Let's say the third week of January must be the delivery, or the last week of January must be the delivery. So it's going to be a January quarter, or a February quarter, or a March quarter, or a December quarter. So if it's a December delivery, it means in the last week of December. If it's a June delivery, in the last week of June. If it's a March delivery, the last week of March. So you usually know which week of the month is delivered and then the delivery month. Of course, because it's exchange traded, the simplest thing for any contract will be trading hours. Gold will be trading from 8.30 in the morning. Silver will begin trading at 8.25. And they close like 1.30 or maybe 1.25. New York time or Eastern Standard. So for each exchange, for each contract, you need to know if you're in the market, when it trades, when it, when it opens, when it closes, what time it opens, what time it closes. All right, trading hours. Uh, next one is actually minimum price fluctuation. So, gold is, uh, oh, let's take a look. It says 12.73.90. Today, now, right? 12.73.90. 12.73.90. 90. And the minimum price fluctuation for gold, I happen to know, is 0.1 dollar, which is the same as 10 cents. So the next price above will be 12.7400, and the next price below will be 12.73. 0.8, All right. So minimum price fluctuation says you can't offer and trade 1273.92. It's impossible. They will tell you that you must trade higher or lower by 10 cents. That's how it's done. Okay. With silver, well, I don't have. Well, I can pull up the price right away. Right. Silver price is 17.49. 17.49. For the silver, it's only one cent. So the next price must be either 17.48 or 17.50. So that's fairly straightforward. So these are the minimum price fluctuations. Well, the next one will be of oh, number seven. Maximum. which we don't need, it's called daily limits. For example, uh, not the exact number, but a rough number, the maximum daily movement on gold will be limited to $100. So it can go up to $100 today, and then it will stop trading. It cannot trade for more than $100 up or more than $100 down. That's the daily limit. For silver, it may be $4 a day or $3 a day. Okay. So if it reaches the highest point, say let's say $100 is the limit. When it reaches the limit, we call it up limit. Up limit. Is when the daily price reaches the upper limit, cannot possibly trade above this price. Usually it means that it will not trade at all for the rest of the day. 
Then for the next day, you're going to increase another $100. You're going to continue trading maybe high, maybe low. So that's, there's an up limit and there's a down limit. So it's not likely or possible that the price of gold will double today. Like it's impossible for the price of oil to double today because there will be just a limit. So if let's say I'm just making the numbers for you to understand, 45 is the price of oil today. It can have a $10 limit, so daily limit. So oil will trade up to 55 and then stop trading. Now, if somebody wants to trade below that price, they can all trade. They can all buy and sell all they want. In other words, if this is the price of 45 today, you can trade all you want between 55 and 35, but it is illegal and impossible to trade above this price or below this price. And that's the thing. It protects traders from excessive Losses. The maximum daily loss will be $10 per barrel, which will equivalent, be equivalent on 1,000 barrels to $10,000. Here, on 100 ounces of gold, the daily limit of $100 means that the maximum loss per gold contract will be $10,000 again. Okay? Well, that's the way it goes. In other words, the exchange will use the daily limit, price limit, in order to limit the daily loss of traders. Next. Well, the next is just delivery process, same as delivery Procedure, I'll put the camera a little bit on this side. Okay? Center now. Delivery process will say when you do the delivery. Within how many days? Maybe I have to deliver within three days. Maybe I have to deliver within seven days. Maybe I have to deliver within ten days. So it's going to say how many days you have to deliver and then where? Which warehouse? The warehouse in Chicago or New York or LA? Well, where's the address of the New York warehouse? Again, if you have a, uh, think of it, one train, 1,000 bags of rice, where are they going to put it, you know? It's going to be one truck, ten trucks, you know, where they're going to store it, okay? So, both sides must agree on where, which place it will be delivered. So, delivery, locate. So, all of this is the delivery process. Okay. So, well, let's see what else. How it's going to be traded. Okay, I can go back. Trading for futures could be very similar to trading in stocks or in other financial markets. Trading could be electronic trading, same as electronic exchange, just like NASDAQ, which is all computer interconnected. Or it could be physical exchange. Just an ordinary exchange, like in New York Stock Exchange will be for stocks, in Chicago is going to be for bonds or for derivatives, commodity derivatives. Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Okay, CBOT, Chicago Board of Options trade. So, you're going to have a trading pit, a 
pit is a small location, usually a circle, usually a couple of meters, maybe three, four, five meters uh, diameter, where all traders will go for a particular contract. So we're going to have a gold pit, you're going to have an oil pit, gas pit, corn pit, rice, whatever it is. So a trading pit is a particular physical location, usually lower, where trading of a particular derivative, let's say futures, will be done. Okay. Now, the pit, let's say, is like only five or three meters wide. It's going to be like a stadium. Then, this is only one meter wide. It's going to be a little bit elevated. And then this is going to be, again, one meter wide and again elevated. So it's going to be like a stadium. We call it like amphitheater. It's going to be a little bit. And here, it's going to be one step up. And here, one step up. And here, one step up. So here is going to be the main traders and market makers. And then, uh, here's going to be the people interested to trade in February contracts. Here are going to be the people interested in uh, March contract. Here is going to be interested in April, in June. So, as the contracts go further out, so it's one month, two month contracts, three months contracts, six months, twelve months contract. So, as people are interested in near maturity, they'll stand very close to the pit. And if they're interested in far out maturities, they'll stay far out. Well, this is, we're talking about one meter, two meter, three meter. They're still there. You can all see the bags, okay? So you get to see who's interested in what type of contract. And they'll signal with their hands, I want to buy, I want to sell, how many contracts, what price, and all the other stuff. Uh, open up price. Open outcry means that every trader and inside will be the market maker or the specialist will buy open outcry, they will yell and they will show with hand signals what they want to buy, so where they are, so I'm interested in March contract and then they, with hands somehow they're going to show I want 5 contract or 2 contract or maybe 20 contract whatever they're interested in and what kind of price they're going to get. So open out price will use language as in yelling and screaming and signs as in hand size and maybe posture of the body of how many contracts at what price and all the other. So open out price will be somehow communicating with your body and language what you want to buy at what prices. This is the opposite will be electronic, where the computer can say, I want seven contracts at this price, whether it's limit or all the other details. So that's open outcry. You're going to have, just like bonds and stocks, you're going to have floor brokers. who will be executing for institutional customers or for retail customers. They'll be executing for others. Then we're going to have professional no, traders who will be executing for their own accounts. These traders will be all pretty much conceptually, economically, will be the same as they're going to be dealers. But we don't call them dealers, we call them traders. You know, these are people who combine, sell, whatever, short-term, long-term, intermediate term. Uh, traders can be Position 
traders. They can trade maybe for two, well, well, you know, they can hold a position for a month, two months, three months, okay? So position traders hold the position for weeks, possibly months. They have day traders. They'll hold the position for hours. And we'll usually day traders will close their position at the end of the day. To Close means that if you have a long position, you will sell and get at zero. If you have a short position, you'll buy. So closing your position means you get down to zero. It means you do not have open position. Your open position is zero and has zero risk. So day traders will close all of their position and will have no net position at the end of the day. And finally, you're going to have the Scalpers, these will be holding position for seconds, occasionally, minutes. In other words, the guy uh, expects very short term movements. He'll buy hoping within 30 seconds or 30 minutes to sell. Day traders will usually hold for minutes. The day trader may hold maybe for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 50 minutes, maybe an hour or two. By the end of the day, he'll be done. The scalper will be done uh, within a couple of minutes. And the position trader will be done by within a couple of So he'll hold maybe two days, five days, three days. But within a couple of weeks, he'll be done. Exactly the same. Orders will be market, just like with stocks and bonds, and orders will be limits. And a limit order will have a limit price. The limit price is set by the Customer. You'll say on gold 1274. I'll say limit 1270. If the price reaches 1270, they'll execute a buy. If the price goes 1269, 1265, if the price goes lower, they'll execute at the lowest possible price. But never higher than 1270. They'll never execute at 71, 72, 73. They'll execute at 1270, maybe 69, whatever the price gets to be. The problem is that the price may never reach 1270 and I may never get to buy at 1270. That's the risk. Next, a few more minutes and we're done. Long position, short position. Okay, an exchange will have a clearinghouse. Let's see what's a clearinghouse. Well, clearinghouse is just a unit or a department of the exchange that oversees all trades and make sure that all traders will have their margin, will have their margin accounts, that everything is deposited. In other words, the clearing house will usually, if you go long today and short tomorrow, that it will, is called offset your requirement. So the clearing house is where all the payments and all settlements take place. Let's see what else. The clearinghouse is the one that will guarantee all trades. So, 
The counterparty will be the clearing house of the exchange. Not the exchange itself, it's a department within the exchange. So when you trade, the counterparty risk is assumed by the clearing house of the exchange. Let's see what else. I already covered. You're going to have interest rate futures, you're going to have currency futures, uh, single stock futures or stock index futures, okay? Uh, deliverable asset, I already deliverable specification, I already covered that. Uh, the contract will have a size, sometimes the size will be barrels of oil, 1,000 ounces of gold, 100 uh, kilograms of rice, 1,000. Uh, but sometimes the contract will just have what's called a face. Then 100,000 US dollars. Okay. The next concept for futures, we're pretty much and I'm almost done, just a few more minutes to complete everything on futures, is called Open Interest. Open Interest refers to all, the total of all long contracts. You count only long contracts. So I got a long, you got a short, we count one. You got two longs, you got two shorts, you count two. So open interest refers to all long contracts, the total of all long contracts for a particular contract. So you're going to have open interest for gold, open interest for oil, open interest for British pounds, open interest for euro, for everything else. And total number of total long contracts will always be exactly the same as total short contracts. So for every contract, meaning for every buyer, there must be exactly one seller. For one long, there must be one short. For hundred longs, there must be exactly hundred shorts. For a million longs, there must be a million shorts. The number of longs is always identical to the number of shorts. So the open interest represents total longs. One or two more minutes. Okay. Uh, next one is offsetting trade. Offsetting trade. If you have a December long contract, selling it is an offsetting trade. So, when you have a long position, an offsetting trade is selling short that position. In other words, an offsetting trade always results in a long plus short. So an offsetting trade will have exactly the same number of longs as shorts. So if you have two long contracts, an offsetting trade will be shorting two. If you have two shorts, an offsetting trade will be buying two contracts. So you're going to have the same longs as short, and an offsetting trade will re always result in a zero open position. An offsetting trade is set to which I did a little above, to close your position. 
if you have a long, when you sell the long, means you have a long and you have one short, you close it, you offset it, it becomes zero. You don't hold one long and one short at the same time. At the end of the day, they get offset. It becomes zero, it becomes nothing. It's, I give you $10, you give me back $10. At the end of the day, I got zero, you got zero. It's offset, it's closed. It's zero, that's it. That's all there is to it. Let me see what else we'll have. I already discussed delivery, which could be physical delivery. You deliver the currency or it's cash settlement. Okay, last thing, again, it's common sense. I already did it, but let's write it out that you have a long and a short when the price goes up the long will gain and the short will lose when the price goes down, the long will lose and the short will gain. Longs speculate on the price going up and shorts speculate on the price going down. And this completes all of the discussion on forwards and futures that we have to cover.